Say, hey, welcome back to another episode of Raw Bill. No. Okay. Say, hey, welcome back to another episode of Raw Bill. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Raw Bill. <laughs> Three, two, one. Smile. <laughs> I am. Are you filming? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Rob Cooks. We're changing it up today. Today we're talking about how to permit a tiny house village, but first I gotta cook up, oh God, that's hot. We gotta cook up some wings. Stick around until the very end of the episode and I'll show you the final results of these suckers. All right, so we got a new, am I in the shot? I don't believe you. Am I in the shot? I wish I could see myself. So we've got a new camera woman on board today. Her name is Savannah. Say hi, Savannah. Sav doesn't want to be just introed into the channel. She's demanding it be an epic B-roll sequence. So I guess we're going to cut to that now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, you're blown out. Move over. Oh, Move over. Is Sav is my new EA, my executive assistant slash camera woman slash good friend. Anyways, on today's episode of Rob Built, we're going to be talking about how to permit a tiny house village. But before we do that, I have to cook dinner for everybody that's here. So there's a lot going on with my tiny house village at the moment. A lot of work goes into doing that from hiring a civil engineer to a soil scientist to a structural engineer that's actually coming out from Chicago. It's really not the most affordable or cost effective way to bring a structural engineer from an entire different state, but he specializes in tree houses, which is what we have planned for phase one of this development. Whew. I need you guys to, oh, sorry, are you filming? Oh God. This guy has no respect <laughs> for a YouTube video. Sound. What's up, you're on camera. No, come on, well, say it. I found a good property, but I don't want to. No! But look where it is. This is this is true. Oh, Newport Beach, definitely a mobile home. There's no house for three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in Newport That's Beach. That's what I'm saying. But look how nice they are. It, it is nice. So oh. this is very much the business here, where we're talking about one thing, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, new opportunity, go! <laughs> I will say I did think that I was gonna break ground a little bit faster, but I got a lot of things going on, and I found out that everyone here works at half speed in terms of vendors my soil scientist, everybody that's involved with the actual creation of this tiny house village is on what's called country time. Meaning if they say they're gonna be here next week, what they really mean is they'll be here next month. But that's all part of the process. So let's head downstairs and I will show you kind of where we're planning our very first build. I'm really excited about this. Again, we're kind of leaning towards an A-frame tree house, but that could literally change in three hours. We, especially when people like Clint just come in and say like, look at this new idea I've got. But that's that's what the Raw Build channel is all about. Unplanned, unscripted, and brought to you by Modelo. Let's head downstairs. But before we head downstairs, how about a little B-roll of my wings? I like this angle the most just because the Smoky Mountains are over there. That's where the smoke comes out in the, in the morning. But the problem is we've got all these trees over here. It's all good. Just take a little bit yeah. off the top or cut a window or something. I'm short, okay? <laughs> go ahead. All right, yeah. Get back up to my, yeah, there we go. This is how you feel so all the time. Th this is, it really is. Okay, so this is the first site that we were planning on expanding here. We've got a very big slope here, but this is absolutely like the shot right here. These mountains back here, I mean, minus the power lines, we'll, we'll work on that. But this shot right here, what we want to do is have our structural engineer come out. And because this slopes, so here's the problem with permitting is that the people behind the desks typically don't like being on the phone with who I call dreamers and newbies and people that are green in general, just because they get a lot of phone calls from people that are like, I want to build a tiny house or people like me. That's like, I want to build a tiny house village. And so they're just like, Oh God, I got to talk to this guy for 30 minutes. And then he probably doesn't even know what he's doing and blah, blah, blah. So this is something I've encountered many, many, many times. And so when I'm running my due diligence, I like to call, but then have other people call and ask the same questions, but slightly different just because when you're not making a lot of progress with someone behind the desk, sometimes you just got to cut your, losses and end the phone call there. But if Clint calls, for example, 
Sorry. <laughs> when Clint calls the next day, he can ask similar questions, but just kind of word them a little bit differently. And he may actually speak to someone completely different in the office too. That's fine. So for me, my strategy with permitting is calling several times and sort of hearing it out of the mouths of different horses, if you will, and then kind of averaging all those responses together. Because what we have found tag teaming the permitting and all of this is that sometimes you just really have to level with the people behind the desk and ask. <laughs> Hold on, I got it. Echo's just like looking up at the, he's like pining at the tree. Yeah, you got that yummy, yum, the yummy, yum, the yum. This is better. Still Echo just pining at the pine <laughs> over here. So one of the things that we often encounter is that you just got to tweak your question a little bit to sort of get through to the people behind the office. You got to speak their language and understand where they're coming from. And when you start using the verbiage that they're accustomed to and actual city code wording and everything like that, I find that a little bit more progress is made. So for example, something as simple as saying alternative structure versus temporary structure. Now for me, an alternative structure would be something like a tiny house, for example. However, you have to comply by all international residential code or all international building code of 2012 here in Gatlin. Tennessee they're a little bit behind but because a tiny house doesn't always necessarily conform to that I have to permit that as what's called a temporary structure and even though it's kind of a semi-permanent structure I have to design that tiny house in a way that breaks down meaning I can take it apart so that it's considered a temporary structure versus a permanently stationed structure so taking off panels and leaving part of the inside exposed to the exterior elements sort of satisfies that here in this county I don't know it's kind of a gray zone to be honest but this is something that we've learned from calling over and over and over again and it wasn't until we started sort of adjusting our questions and kind of using more verbiage that they're accustomed to that we really started to break ground so for a while we thought that building a tiny house was just there was no way to do it like a tiny a-frame for example they led us to believe that there was no way that we were going to be able to permit that but after kind of escalating it and talk to different people and then talking to the department head of the building and safety department we did find out that by deconstructing certain panels and making it a temporary structure we can now have tiny a-frames on the property but call your city and check ultimately the takeaway here is call over and over and over again the first day you're gonna be Rob the next day you're gonna be Robert the third day you'll be John whatever you have to do because oftentimes when I call they're like did you call yesterday about that Airstream treehouse I'm like no it was Clint all right let's go back down all right we were just about to leave but I definitely went on a tangent because I'm ADHD Heep. we want to build on this slope right here but in order for us to do that we have to call in a structural engineer because it's sloped a certain degree so if you like I don't know the exact slopage if you will definitely not a word Get her uh, on it. Yeah, can you can 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 you can you, Google, can you Google this for me? So basically, what we have to do is, if it slopes a certain amount, let's 2%. say, huh? I think it's two percent. No. No, 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 it's not. All right, basically, if it slopes more than like 10 to 20 degrees, somewhere in there, I can't really remember, you have to hire either a soils engineer or a structural engineer to design your piers and your decking in a way that is secure for a, a hillside build, basically. And that has to be signed by what's called a PE, a professional engineer. It's an engineer that goes through extra schooling, extra certification so that they can stamp plans and basically approve of the structural elements of bigger projects. I don't know. I honestly don't know if that's true, but it's something like, <laughs> it's something like that. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so PEs are going to play basically a very big role on this property just because there's so many slopes. Of my 52 acres here, most of that acreage is mountainous. So because of that, I'm going to be calling in professional engineers to pretty much stamp every plan that I'm going to have. Totally fine. Typically, these structural engineers and all the other engineers that I'm enlisting for this specific project run about $100 an hour. So by the end of this entire project, I'm predicting I'm going to spend between $10 and $20,000 in engineering fees alone. Oh God. Yeah, it'll be all right though. Ultimately, I'd rather pay $20,000 dollars for a professional engineer than a million dollars to a lawsuit because we mathed our decks wrong all right let's go let, for real now let's go to the bottom so here's an interesting spot on my property it's actually very flat very ideal for a tiny a-frame cabin i'm currently working on getting a den outdoors tiny a-frame kit and this would be such a beautiful peak to do it on but one of the things that you have to do when you're planning a village or a pud a planned unit development but one of the things you really have to plan for is parking and where people are going to actually put their cars on your property because in theory since I'm zoned for one unit per two acres, I can put up to 26 different units on my property. However, while it's all good and gravy, ultimately people need a place to park. And as much as I'd love to place something right here, I actually think that I'm gonna use this as somewhat of a parking lot. Now, the other thing that I have to consider too though, is even though I did wanna do an A-frame over here and or create this into a parking lot, my actual house, like my residence is up here, which we won't be living here forever. This will eventually become an Airbnb. But the thing is people come to the mountains for somewhat seclusion. How is this framed right now? Is right. it like nips up? Uh, you're 
pants up. Is nips, do you want nips? No, I do not. Never okay, nips good. up. <laughs> the thing that I'm really struggling with is that while this is gonna be an Airbnb, you sort of rent a 50 acre mountain cottage for seclusion. So if someone rents this house up here, but they see 50 different tiny houses, I don't really know how they're gonna take that. Ultimately, you disclose that in your listing and you prep people before their stay so that they know what they're getting into. So that's why I'm actually considering turning this into a lodge where I'm gonna house different cleaners, maybe a property manager, I actually have maybe breakfast cooked here or some kind of food or coffee station up here. People can get Wi-Fi up here and make this the community area for the entire tiny house village, which I actually think would be a really nice selling point. But I'm still deciding on that because ultimately this house up here would gross between four and $10,000 every single month on Airbnb. So I'm really kind of at the decision if I wanna make more money or if I wanna really invest in the actual communal part of my tiny house village. But curious to know what you think. Should I make this an Airbnb? Should I turn it into a community center? Leave me a comment down below and give me your thoughts. And uh, we'll end this take here because I can tell Sav's little arms are shaking. <laughs> oh, this house would gross between four and 10,000 a month. It's like, <laughs> This would grow somewhere between 50 cents and about 85 grand. That it is a like big a range. range. It is because in January and February, it would probably be like 4,000. But from March to December, it would be probably six to 10. True. Cool. So shut up. My bad, dude. How you feeling on your first <laughs> venture here? My arms feel like spaghetti. Mom spaghetti, he's nervous. All right, let's walk down to the bottom. So here's an interesting part of the property that I want to build on. I have this entire ravine right here. So actually 90% of my property actually goes all the way back here, but it's very mountainous and like I said, it's very difficult to access. So we're currently talking through with the different engineers on how to create different rope bridges and suspension bridges that actually take you to the rest of the property over here. Hi, Captain Crunch. <laughs> But it's kind of tough because this ravine right here has water that runs through it for a portion of the year. And if it runs for enough of the year, then different animals and different life forms can grow in the river. And so we have to work with the civil engineer to design our spaces in a way that's not encroaching on mother nature. Totally respect that, but it makes building over a ravine, through a ravine, on a ravine, really quite difficult. So right now, is your hair ready, bud? It's, uh, it's gusty out here. <laughs> so, <laughs> Don't be nervous, man. It's just funny. I'm so nervous to be on camera right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> what should I say? So we're currently. <laughs> All right, so here Rob and I are at what we think is going to be site number two of the raw built tiny house empire. And initially, well, what, how, what, how do you pronounce that? Raw built. Yeah, there Ro you built. go. He's been raw saying built. row built, it by looks the like way. Robot. Yeah, he's been saying <laughs> row built since the beginning of the channel. Uh, it's raw built. <laughs> I think that's going to clear up a lot of questions for you. <laughs> yeah, for everyone, that, everyone out there that says row built now. So anyway, we like this position because not only does it have a great view, but it's already kind of naturally flat and seems like a pretty obvious building site. Yep. But as we kind of looked at it and explored our ideas more, we realized maybe we should just make this a parking area and have a cantilevered SAT word of the day right there. Yeah, right. Uh, like a cantilevered tree house or just a big deck kind of overlooking this ravine here. But why don't you guys tell us what you think we should do down oh in the comments. Oh my God, we're getting a plug, a comment <laughs> plug. Dude, you are nailing this. I didn't even coach him to say that. Let's go. That raises the big question of where would people shower and use the toilet? Mm -hmm. So we've still got a couple things to work out, but this is definitely one of our favorite sites on the property. Worst comes to worst, you can kind of squat over this like ravine right here and if you if you angle yourself correctly your hand. <laughs> <laughs> i got it uh and then if you yeah if you angle yourself correctly the poop just comes right off the cliff here This is another really interesting spot on my property, but here's one of the worries that we have when we're designing tree houses is that in December, we actually had a very big snowstorm. They typically aren't this big, but it actually knocked down a few big trees at the bottom of my property. And so we're a little nervous to actually trust these trees here, but that's sort of the importance of working with the right team. So we have a structural engineer that specializes in tree house design. We're gonna have an arborist on site as well. And then we're also gonna be having a civil engineer. So between the two different engineers and the arborist, we're gonna decide if this spot right here can support the weight of a tree house. We really don't know, but we're gonna try to make this work just for a few reasons. While we don't have a view here, we do have a creek down here or a creek and you're you're kind of emerged within mother nature and you'll have different trees surrounding you and you'll hear a creek in the morning while you're drinking your coffee. So I think this would still be a nice little serene spot, but ultimately it's gonna come down to what my team decides. And of course, as I mentioned, parking is very important here. So we gotta figure out where people are gonna park because if you look over here, this road is relatively narrow. However, I do have a flat meadow down here. So what I'm thinking is we're gonna create a small parking pad down there and just have people 
hike up over here, which is really gonna be the OG part of this tiny house, which is my Airstream down here. We're still kind of working on what this is gonna be, which really brings us to one of the first sites on the tiny house village, and it's my Airstream, if you remember that video. If you haven't watched it yet, I'll link it right over here. Here's what we're dealing with with the original Airstream build out. I can live in it for up to six months at a time. However, renting it out on a short-term rental basis is a little bit difficult because I'm not exactly zoned for it, and I would have to change the zoning of this property to allow me to do RVs or trailer stays, but there is an interesting loophole, and it's that I could actually build a house or a tiny house or a tree house right over here and if I permit the tree house as a single family residence and build a deck out here that encompasses this airstream well then what I can permit is the tiny house for short-term rental stays and make my airstream somewhat of a bonus room if you will with codes and ordinances it's not always black and white and sometimes it's all about finding loopholes and gray areas and really exposing them because some of these laws are ridiculous no I'm just kidding get permitted do everything that you can but ultimately I could just throw this on Airbnb right now but because I'm trying to permit this correctly from head to toe and I want to eventually maybe even sell this house as a business to an investor, it behooves me to just pay the extra money, take the extra time to permit this correctly. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. Right now I'm envisioning a tree house right now that sort of connects to the outdoor living space where you can hang out in this airstream, have fun, drink some beers, and enjoy this beautiful stream. I don't always have something to say. I'm glad we caught that on film. <laughs> so if you watch my first video that talked about phase one of my tiny house village, I'll link it up here. <laughs> Shameless plug. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you watch my first, my phase one video, we talked about what we were going to do out here. We wanted to build A-frames, but really as we started to assess the area, we found that there were some really big, thick trees. Ellie, are you kidding me? What are you doing? Nah. <laughs> Just a dog in her creek. After assessing this a little bit further, we've decided to pivot for the 18th time. And so now phase one is actually gonna be tree houses. In total, this little area over here is very flat and it's about two to three acres. We're actually okay with crowding this space a little bit more with really cool, unique tree houses because we wanna be able to cater to people that are coming in big group. I wanna rent the entire land out for an event or just for a family vacation where everybody gets their own cocoon in the trees. More to come on that as we begin to walk the land a little bit more with our structural engineer, but I'm really excited because I've always wanted to build a tree house it's been a dream of mine pretty much my entire life yeah pretty much my I don't know who's gonna fact check this you're gonna actually look into my past and interview my friends and say like hey is it true that Rob's dream is to build a treehouse <laughs> all right you know what we did this 18 times this is the take let's go a couple small things as we wrap up this video over here this right here is a meadow and not to mansplain what this is but it's a meadow and it's mostly flat so it would seem that it's a very obvious place to build tiny houses and the tiny house village and everything but remember there are a few things that we have to keep in mind a parking so this may actually be converted into somewhat of a parking lot but b we don't really have a lot of places to put our septic tanks and our leach lines and everything like that so i'm having a soil scientist come out next week and basically what he's doing is he's digging into the ground testing the soil determining different percolation rates which is basically how fast water absorbs into the ground and based on that he's going to design different spots on my property where I can build a septic tank. This is something that's necessary for my city for them to sign off on my tiny house village or my PUD. So when the soil scientist comes out, he's actually going to be mapping different possibilities on my property. And as we actually begin to plan this out with my civil engineer, we'll actually decide on where we're going to put the septic tank. But basically, we're going to need about three to five options on our property before we can get started. And then we'll plan around where those septic tanks are going to be stationed. But really, the frustrating thing about this is that my civil engineer is the person that's really leading this charge here. But we require different information from all the different vendors. And my soil scientist is the only person that works in the city. And he's been ignoring my phone calls for like two months until five Finally, I got him on the phone and I was like, please, my tiny house village is waiting for you to come out to tell us where to poop, verbatim. It basically was like that. But anyways, once he comes out in maps, I can finally give that information to my civil engineer. My civil engineer can really plan out the different spaces, the setbacks on my property, sign off on the fact that we're not encroaching on nature. And once all of that is put together on what's called the master plan, meaning where the units are gonna be, where people are gonna park, where the drainage flows is on my property and where the septic is gonna be, then we can submit that to planning and zoning. They'll approve of it. Then we'll have a neighborhood meeting where we have to get everyone informed on what this development is going to be and then we go to building and safety and fight with them about the different structures and the tiny houses and the minimum square footages and all that kind of stuff so it's a little bit of a process i'm pretty sure what, this whole video was very convoluted but really that's what permitting is a very big convoluted process so as i learn more and as i find more loopholes and gray areas and learn how to navigate the process of permitting a tiny house village i'll be posting them to this channel so be sure to hit the like button the subscribe button and that little notification bell so that you're notified anytime that i post more tiny house content that'll wrap up today's episode of rob built clint what do you think what do you think pal 
How do you, how, you feel like this was a successful debut? 8 out of just, 10. Just, please don't talk. Uh, that'll end today's episode of Raw Bill. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Here's the truth. Here's the, the real version of Raw Bill. Where we're winded as hell walking up. That's why you're out of breath when you talk. I know. <laughs> That's why we always walk downhill in our videos and not up. <laughs>